In 1935, the city of Sydney, Australia had a shark attack problem. There had been eight attacks in the last year alone, six of which had been fatal. And every time it happened, the local newspapers would write stories describing the scenes in graphic detail. They would call the sharks monsters and recount how they'd latched onto some poor teenager and shaken their body around like a rag doll. Certainly, these stories fueled the public's fear of sharks, but they also inspired fascination. People were amazed by the power and ferociousness of these creatures, and so they wanted to see them up close. Luckily, Bert Hobson was more than happy to oblige them. Bert and his brother Charlie owned the Coogee Beach Aquarium in Sydney. During the warmer months, the aquarium was used as a public swimming pool, but during the winter and fall, when it was too cold to swim, Bert would pump ocean water into the pool and then fill it with all kinds of aquatic creatures for visitors to see. But nothing got more people through the aquarium door than a shark. Even as the country struggled to pull itself out of the Great Depression, which was the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world, a shark could still draw big crowds and big money. Over the last few years, Bert had managed to capture and exhibit more than 20 sharks. But the problem was, none of the sharks lived very long. They typically died within just a few weeks of being in captivity. And so, the Hobson brothers were always on the hunt for a new shark. This was especially true in April of 1935, because Coogee Beach was going to play host to a massive parade in honor of Anzac Day. Anzac Day is a national day of remembrance in Australia and New Zealand that primarily is about honoring fallen soldiers. Tens of thousands of people were scheduled to attend the event on April 25th, and Bert figured if he could catch a shark, the aquarium could capitalize on some of that holiday foot traffic. So on the morning of April 18th, Bert headed out onto the water in his big fishing boat. The day before, he'd set some fishing lines about a mile and a half from the beach and baited them with chunks of mackerel, hoping that when he returned, he'd find a shark tangled up in his lines. And Bert would not be disappointed. That day, when he checked the lines, there was this massive 14 and a half foot long tiger shark ensnared in his trap. Even more exciting for Bert was the shark was exhausted and not trying to put up a fight. It had clearly spent the night before struggling to free itself, and now it just didn't have the energy to resist Bert reeling it in. So Bert grabbed the lines and attached them to his boat, and then he towed the shark back to the aquarium where it was put into the pool. Looking down at his prize swimming around the tank, Bert was sure this huge shark was going to be a massive media sensation. And Bert would be right, although not for the reasons he expected. The Hobson brothers bought ad space in all the major local newspapers announcing their newest attraction. They called it the largest tiger shark ever in captivity. And that may actually have been true. Most tiger sharks are 10 to 14 feet in length, and this one was 14 and a half feet long. The prospect of seeing this giant creature attracted a massive crowd. However, for most of the week leading up to Anzac Day, the prized shark didn't put on much of a show. It barely ate, and then when it did, it just kind of seemed docile and slow. It certainly was not living up to the ferocious monster hype the brothers had been selling. But then something strange happened. On Anzac Day, Thursday, April 25th, the brothers opened their aquarium early to try to capitalize on as much of the pre-parade foot traffic as they could, but again, that day, the shark just kind of swam slowly around and barely ate, and so by late afternoon, only about a dozen people were still watching the shark. And just as those last dozen or so people were getting ready to leave the aquarium right around 4.30 p.m., the shark started acting weird. Without warning, the shark just started thrashing violently around in the water. Its body was moving so fast and its tail was flapping so aggressively that it practically beat the water to a foam. The spectators had absolutely no idea what was going on, but they were completely mesmerized by the spectacle of it. The shark then started rapidly swimming in circles around the pool, periodically smashing into the walls. And then, all of a sudden, the shark just stopped swimming. And for a moment, it just floated motionless in the center of the pool, and then it just sank to the bottom. At first, all the onlookers assumed the shark must have died. But then, they started to see this stuff rising up through the water just above the shark. And when this stuff got to the surface, it formed this mass of chunky, putrid scum that smelled and looked like vomit. And in fact, that's what it was. 
Vomiting is a fairly common behavior in sharks. When they get stressed out, like when they're caught in nets or beached, or when they've been dragged from their habitat and then put in a pool that's too small for them, they sometimes throw up. The behavior is even more common in tiger sharks because tiger sharks will eat pretty much anything that crosses their path, including things they can't digest, like turtle shells and metal, which is why they're always having to throw up to get these things out of their body. But no one in the audience knew this, so as this pool of shark vomit was beginning to settle on the surface of the water, the spectators just stared at it, trying to understand what it was. And as they were looking, they started to notice these shapes inside of the vomit that they sort of recognized. At first, what they saw were things like fish bones and shark fins, the kind of things you would expect to find in the stomach of a shark. But then there were also these other things that you wouldn't really expect to see like a dead rat and a partially digested bird. And then they noticed something else, a human arm. And this arm had a rope tied around its wrist. The spectators were horrified. They started gasping and screaming and shouting for someone to call the police. Bert Hobson grabbed a stick and did his best to push the arm over to the side of the pool while his brother Charlie rushed inside to call the authorities. By the time the cops arrived, the shark had recovered from its sickness and was back to swimming slow laps around the pool. So the first thing the cops had to do was secure the arm before the shark decided it was hungry again. The detectives lifted the arm from the water using the rope around its wrist, and then they placed it inside of a burlap bag they brought to collect evidence. And then the police turned their attention to the obvious question everyone had. How did this arm wind up inside of this shark? The Hobson brothers assured the police there was no way someone could have thrown the arm into the pool without their knowledge because the shark had been under constant surveillance since arriving at the aquarium seven days earlier. There was also no way someone could have fallen into the pool during off hours because they kept the aquarium locked when they weren't there. So the Hobson brothers were certain that the arm must have already been in the shark's belly when it arrived at their aquarium. And the victim, whoever they were, was likely just another casualty of the latest wave of shark attacks in Sydney's harbors. But the police weren't so sure about that theory, at least not the part about a random shark attack. To them, the rope tied around the arm's wrist seemed to suggest something more intentional, possibly murder or maybe suicide. They didn't know, but something seemed off. But regardless, the police knew their first order of business was just identifying the owner of the arm so that their family could be notified about their death. Now, in 1935, under normal circumstances, trying to figure out whose arm this was would be nearly impossible because DNA had not been discovered yet. And so all investigators could do was just look at the arm and see if there were any features on it that could lead to the owner. And in this case, there were. The first thing they noticed was that the arm was in shockingly good condition. In fact, there appeared to be hardly any signs of digestion at all, which was surprising considering how long it must have been in the shark's stomach. So before the police even left the aquarium, they called a fingerprinting specialist who drove out to the site and then cut and peeled the skin off the fingertips for later analysis. The second thing the police noticed was a tattoo on the inner forearm. It was an illustration of two boxers facing off as if they were in the ring. Their bodies and gloves were drawn in blue ink, and their boxing shorts were colored red. The design was unique enough that police felt hopeful a friend or family member might recognize it just from a written description in the newspaper. But when the police drove over to the morgue to have the arm analyzed further, what they would learn there would ensure that all the newspapers in the state would be running much more than just a written description of that tattoo. At the morgue, the local medical officer became instantly fixated on the question of how the arm had come to be removed from the owner's body. Up to that point, everyone, including most of the police, assumed the shark had just bitten the arm off. But to the medical officer, the arm did not look like it had been bitten off at all. There were none of the ragged tears or bite marks like you'd expect to see with a shark attack. Instead, the arm appeared to have been cut from the body with surgical precision, most likely with a knife, which meant this death was likely not the result of a shark attack. In all likelihood, it was a murder by a person, and then after this guy was killed, the shark was either fed the body part, or after the parts were dumped into the water, the shark happened to find the arm and ate it. This new twist on the case created an instant media frenzy. 
Newspapers all over the country ran stories about the strange situation with the shark arm in Sydney. And a bunch of those papers actually ran a photo of the tattoo, along with instructions for readers to contact the authorities if they recognized it. And someone did. On April 28th, just three days after the scene at the aquarium, police received a call from a guy saying he'd seen the photo of the tattoo in the paper, and he knew who the arm belonged to. Without a doubt, the guy said, that arm belongs to my older brother, Jim Smith. To most of the police at the precinct, the name Jim Smith meant nothing. But for Detective Frank Matthews, the man who would be leading the so-called shark arm case, hearing the name Jim Smith would completely change the way he was thinking about the investigation ahead of him. Because Matthews knew that Jim could not have been just a random victim. About a year earlier, Jim had become a secret police informant. It started with an insurance fraud scheme gone wrong. Some wealthy men had bought a yacht called the Pathfinder, and then they over-insured it. They then hired Jim to be the captain of the Pathfinder, and his job was to drive and maintain the boat, and then, at an appointed date and time, sink it. The wealthy men would then cash in the insurance claim and split the proceeds amongst those involved in the scheme. But when Jim was actively sinking the boat as ordered, a water policeman saw it happening and yelled out, offering to help. But Jim panicked and just pretended not to hear the police officer, allowing the boat to continue to sink. And so later on, when the wealthy men tried to file their insurance claim on the boat, that water policeman remembered that strange encounter with Jim, and before long, the insurance claim was flagged for fraud. Detective Matthews had been assigned to that case, and Jim was one of the first people brought in for questioning. But as soon as they started talking, Jim broke down completely and told the detective everything. In exchange for immunity, Jim promised to supply Detective Matthews with information on Sydney's vast criminal underworld. This was an extremely dangerous trade for Jim to make. Because of the massive financial fallout caused by the Great Depression, desperation had driven many otherwise law-abiding Sydney residents to participate in some capacity in this criminal underworld. And people like Jim, who snitched to the police, threatened their livelihood. So, when Detective Matthews heard that the shark arm victim was Jim Smith, he assumed that someone must have found out that Jim was a police informant and they had had him killed to shut him up. But the detective didn't reveal any of this to Jim's brother when they spoke. He simply asked the brother to come down to the station and give a formal statement, which he agreed to do. The next morning, Jim's brother arrived at the police station, and with him was Jim's wife. She fought back tears as she told police it had been more than 10 days since she or anyone else had seen Jim. The last time they spoke to him, he said he'd been hired to take a wealthy man out on a fishing trip. He said he didn't know how long he'd be gone, but he'd be staying at a cabin on the coast, and if they needed to reach him, he would be checking his messages at the Hotel Cecil in Cronulla. Cronulla is one of Sydney's many coastal suburbs. By this point, Detective Matthews could tell this was going to be a very challenging investigation with a lot of media scrutiny. And part of him wondered if maybe he was jumping to conclusions. Maybe Jim hadn't been murdered. Maybe he really had just been attacked by a shark. And if he had, then most likely the rest of Jim's body, or at least more of his body, would be inside of that tiger shark. And as it happened, that tiger shark had actually died shortly after vomiting up Jim's arm. And so, Detective Matthews went to the dock where the shark's body was being held by a fish oil merchant, and there he watched as the giant fish was cut open and nothing but fish parts fell out of it. This was enough to convince Matthews that this was no animal attack. Jim had to have been murdered by a person. So he tipped his hat to the fish oil merchant and headed back to the station where he would make plans for the next phase of the investigation, canvassing Cronulla, where Jim had told his wife he would be checking his messages. The first place police were sent in Cronulla was the bar at the Hotel Cecil, and immediately police got a hit. When the bartender saw a photo of Jim, he instantly told police that he recognized him and even called him by name. He said, that's Jim Smith. Apparently, Jim had visited this bar on several occasions, enough to be on a first name basis with the bartender. And also, the bartender said Jim was just a very memorable guy. 
He was tall and athletic, and at one point he trained to be a boxer, which is why he had that tattoo on his forearm of the two boxers. But the bartender said it had been a long time since Jim had come around. The last time he saw Jim was the evening of April 8th. Jim arrived in the early afternoon and stayed for several hours, drinking beer and playing dominoes with the locals. And then around 6 p.m., he left with a friend called Mr. Williams, a man that the bartender described as being very, very short. Detective Matthews knew who the bartender was talking about, and he also knew that this very short man was not named Mr. Williams. The real name of the short man was Patty Brady, and Matthews knew he was a very close friend of Jim's. Patty was well known to police as a master forger. He'd picked up the talent in his 20s while he was in the military. Patty had been in and out of jail on a regular basis since he was 11 years old. In fact, the police had an active warrant out for his arrest in connection with some forging charges, which Matthews assumed was the reason Patty was going around using a fake name. He didn't want to get arrested. But despite being a career criminal, Patty was not known to be a violent criminal. So even though Patty seemed like he could have been the last person to see Jim alive, the combination of him being Jim's close friend and Patty being non-violent made it hard for investigators to believe that he might have had anything to do with Jim's murder. But over the next few days, as police continued speaking to residents of Cronulla, it started to seem like Patty had in fact done harm to his friend. The information police gathered in Cronulla led them to a cottage on the water in Cronulla, and this cottage was being rented by Patty. And apparently, on April 8th, after Jim and Patty had left the Hotel Cecil, the pair had traveled by boat to this cottage and gone inside together. But the next day, only Patty came out, and after that, no one heard from Jim again. Initially, police couldn't think of a good reason why Patty might want to kill his friend, but when Matthews followed up on where Patty went on April 9th, so the morning after he and Jim had gone into the cottage together, a theory started to form in Matthews' head. Matthews learned that on the morning of April 9th, Patty left the cottage and headed for a taxi depot. The driver of the taxi told police that Patty looked disheveled and totally out of it. Patty asked the driver to take him to McMahon's Point, a wealthy community on Sydney's North Shore. The driver dropped Patty off outside of this large fancy house right above the water, and he watched Patty go inside. Patty would stay in the house for about 40 minutes, and then he would call another cab to come pick him up and drive him back to Cronulla. Some of the detectives wondered who a guy like Patty would be visiting in a fancy place like McMahon's Point. But Detective Matthews knew exactly which house the driver was talking about, and he knew exactly who lived there. The house belonged to a well-known businessman named Reginald Holmes. Back in the 1850s, Holmes's father was considered to be the best boat builder in Sydney. He built luxury yachts and speedboats, and he made an absolute fortune selling them. And then, when he retired, he handed the whole boating empire over to his oldest son, Reginald. For decades, the Holmes family lived like royalty in Sydney Harbor. But then the Great Depression hit, and Holmes's yacht building business, like all other luxury businesses, went downhill fast. So to maintain his luxury lifestyle and preserve the prestige of his name, Reginald Holmes had found other ways of making money. Mostly, he used his boats to facilitate drug smuggling off the coast of Sydney Harbor. Many people were involved, but hardly anyone ever got in trouble for it because at the time, there were only two cops in Sydney assigned to drug cases. But the thing that put Holmes on Matthew's radar was the sinking of the Pathfinder. Remember how Jim became an informant after a couple of wealthy men hired him to sink their yacht, the Pathfinder? Well, Detective Matthews had recently discovered that Reginald Holmes and his close friend, Albert Stannard, were those two wealthy men. The only reason Matthews had not pursued charges against them was that they had withdrawn their insurance claim after he had started investigating them. At this point, the police felt nearly certain that Holmes had to be involved somehow in Jim's death. There were just too many coincidences. But they didn't have enough evidence to actually charge Holmes with anything. So instead, they went after Patty. At 6.30 p.m. on May 16th, police arrested Patty at his home and drove him back to the precinct where he was subjected to more than six hours of questioning. 
But in all that time, Patty skirted every one of the investigator's questions and barely broke a sweat. Unlike Jim, Patty was a career criminal who lived by a sort of code of honor, meaning he would never snitch. But Patty also realized that he was facing murder charges, which meant he could be facing the death penalty if he was convicted. So eventually, Patty's code kind of eroded, and he made a calculated decision. If he was going to be forced to take the fall for Jim's death, he was going to make sure that Holmes went down with him. Patty told police in an official statement that he'd first met Holmes about a year earlier, back when Jim had been hired to be the captain of the Pathfinder. But after that big insurance scam failed with the Pathfinder, Patty said that Jim was left without any money because he didn't get paid for the scam. And so he and Patty came up with a new scam and presented it to Holmes. The idea was to forge checks from Holmes's wealthier clients in amounts so small that the clients wouldn't notice. Holmes would supply the checks, Patty would forge the signatures, and Jim would cash the checks from his account. And then all three men would split the profits. It's unclear why someone like Reginald Holmes would sign up for such a high-risk, low-reward kind of scam, but reading between the lines in Patty's statement, Detective Matthews considered the possibility that perhaps Jim was angry about not getting paid for the Pathfinder job, and he might have told Holmes that if he didn't cooperate with he and Patty's forging scam, that Jim would go to police about Holmes' role in the Pathfinder insurance scam. Whatever the motivation was, Holmes agreed to participate with Patty and Jim. And for a long time, their scam worked, and the three men made some nice money. Eventually, though, Jim and Patty got greedy and decided they wanted to level up the scam operation. They wanted to forge a check for a whopping 620 pounds, which, for reference, would be worth more than 11,000 pounds today when adjusted for inflation. Holmes agreed and produced the check, and in the week leading up to Jim's disappearance, Patty visited Holmes's house many times to practice forging the signature. In fact, according to Patty's statement, that was why he visited Holmes on the morning of April 9th. But when it came to the death of his friend Jim Smith, Patty said he didn't know anything. He said that when he left the cabin that morning on April 9th to go to Holmes' house, Jim was alive and well. The police weren't sure if they believed Patty's version of events, but his statement gave them what they needed to go after Holmes. So the next morning, Holmes was brought in for questioning. Holmes was only 44 years old and he'd lived a life of immense privilege, but when he walked into the police station on May 17th, he seemed much older and more frail than a 44-year-old should be. There were rumors that after the Pathfinder scam had failed, Holmes had had a nervous breakdown and he had begun self-medicating with alcohol and cocaine. The police presented Holmes with a copy of Patty's statement, but after Holmes read it, he denied every word. Not only did he claim to have no idea what Patty was talking about in the statement, Holmes told police that he didn't even know who Patty was and he certainly had never visited Holmes' house. Obviously, the police knew this was a lie. But Holmes was a powerful person with powerful lawyers, and for the time being, the police could not force him to talk. Instead, they made another move against Patty. On Sunday, May 19th, the news hit the papers. Patty was officially being charged with the murder of Jim Smith. There would be a public trial, which meant if Patty stuck to his story, Holmes would be compelled to testify in front of the press about both his shady business dealings and the death of Jim Smith. Holmes knew that that kind of media attention would ruin him and his family. So on the morning of May 20th, a day after Patty was officially charged with murder, Holmes got up early and headed down to the harbor. The weather was cold and foggy, but Holmes was determined to get out on the water. So he walked to the wharf, where his friend and co-conspirator, Albert Stannard, kept a small boatyard. Stannard wasn't at the harbor just yet, but Holmes found one of Stannard's employees who was just starting to set up for the day. Holmes asked the employee if he could borrow one of Albert's speedboats for a quick ride along the coastline. The employee could easily tell that Holmes was drunk, but he knew that Holmes was a skilled boater and a close friend of his boss, so he said, sure, I'll get you set up. The man filled the boat with fuel and oil and then pushed it out onto the water. Holmes climbed in, threw the boat into high gear, and sped away from the dock. It was only about 7.30 in the morning, and the ordinary people of Sydney were just beginning to board their commuter ferries across the harbor. But Holmes appeared to be on a mission. 
As he headed east toward open water, his eyes stared straight ahead. He pushed the boat to go faster and faster until tears were streaming out of his eyes. And then he abruptly cut the engine. As the boat gently rocked in the waves, Holmes found himself staring at a particular stretch of coastline, Piper Point, the most expensive suburb in all of Sydney. He thought about all the people he knew who lived there and imagined them reading the horrible headlines that were sure to be written about him during the upcoming trial. With his eyes looking straight ahead, Holmes reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a bottle of brandy. There wasn't much left in the bottle, but he gulped down the last of it and then threw the bottle over his shoulder. And then Holmes reached back into his pocket and pulled out a revolver. And there, within full view of the people who lived on Piper Point, Holmes pointed the gun at his forehead and pulled the trigger. The gun went off and the blast threw Holmes's body out of the boat and into the water. But shockingly, he survived. The bullet hit the thickest part of his forehead, so instead of puncturing his skull, it just sort of flattened there against his forehead and then fell to the ground, leaving him with a giant flesh wound on his face. As soon as Holmes hit the water, he bobbed back to the surface like a cork, and for a second he just looked around wondering what happened while blood gushed from his forehead. Then he just swam back over to his boat and climbed inside. Meanwhile, the residents of Piper Point, who had actually seen the attempted suicide, began calling the police. The water police were dispatched to the area, and they raced towards the injured boater, but as soon as they got close to his boat, Holmes would just turn his boat around and speed away. This happened over and over again, with the water police trying to get close enough to help, and Holmes cutting the wheel sharply and rushing away from them at the last second, and even though Holmes periodically would pass out behind the wheel, either from blood loss or drunkenness or both, he still managed to evade the water police for more than four hours. Finally, Detective Matthews and his squad were notified of what was going on out on the water, and so they headed out in their own boat, and with the help of Holmes's own brother in another boat, they were able to finally jump on board of Holmes's craft and tackle him and pull the keys out of his ignition. Holmes was taken back to shore and sent immediately to the hospital, and then five days later, when Holmes was finally healthy enough, he told detectives he was ready to talk. Holmes told police that Patty had been blackmailing him for months, threatening to reveal what he knew about the Pathfinder insurance scam if Holmes didn't pay him. But then, on the morning of April 9th, the morning after Jim was last seen at the cottage with Patty, Patty had come to Holmes' house looking disheveled and carrying a big brown leather bag. Patty told Holmes that he'd been with Jim at the cottage the night before, but they'd gotten into a fight that ended with Jim getting killed. So Patty had loaded Jim's body into a tin trunk he found at the cottage and disposed of it by dumping it into the water. But apparently, not all of Jim's body had fit inside of that tin trunk. Holmes said that at that point, Patty reached into this brown leather bag he had with him and he pulled out Jim's arm, holding it by a rope that he had tied around the wrist. Holmes said this scared him so badly that he immediately decided to just do whatever Patty wanted in fear that Patty might kill him too. And so from that point onward, whenever Patty called to ask for money, Holmes would give it to him. To the police handling the interrogation, Holmes seemed genuinely afraid as he spoke. He chain smoked and his hands shook when he signed his statement, but it was impossible to tell if he was afraid of Patty or of the stain this case was going to leave on his reputation. In any case, the majority of the details in his story lined up with what the police had uncovered in their investigation. So they asked Holmes if he would be willing to testify that Patty killed Jim and disposed of Jim's body, and Holmes said he would. Now, not all of the detectives believed that Patty was guilty. The idea that this tiny guy could have killed this huge athletic guy, Jim, who had literally been at one point a professional fighter, seemed totally implausible. But with all the media attention on this case, the police were facing an immense amount of pressure to just close it. And since they still couldn't find Jim's body, Holmes' story was their best shot at closing the case. Before Holmes left the station, the detectives asked him if he wanted police protection. But Holmes declined. Before Patty could officially be indicted for murder, the police would have to present their evidence to the coroner. In cases where a wrongful death is suspected, it is the coroner's job to determine the cause of death and who may have been responsible. 
On May 30th, the lead detectives were called to the office of the coroner to present all of the information they had uncovered in the case of Jim Smith's death. But after presenting all their evidence, the coroner told them that there was not yet enough information to determine how Jim Smith had died. And so they would have to have an inquest. An inquest is a judicial inquiry to ascertain the facts relating to an incident, such as a death. The date for the inquest was set for June 12th, which meant detectives had just two weeks to prepare all of their evidence and just two weeks to hopefully finally find Jim's body. But at the end of those two weeks, despite searching the water extensively, police did not locate Jim's body, which meant pretty much their entire case against Patty would rest on the testimony of Reginald Holmes, a man who just weeks earlier had publicly demonstrated that he was both dangerous and mentally unstable. And as the days until the inquest ticked by, Holmes's mental health only seemed to worsen. He spent entire days drinking in his bed, scared that if he went outside, he would be killed, either for what he'd said to police or for what he might say on the stand at the inquest. And it would turn out his fears were legitimate. In the early hours of June 12th, the day of the inquest, a police officer was making his rounds when he noticed a car idling by the side of the road. Its headlights were on and the passenger door was open and the driver was just kind of sitting there leaning forward. June is wintertime in Australia and in a coastal city like Sydney, the wind that sweeps in from the harbor can be extremely cold. And so worried something was wrong because this guy's door is open, the patrolman quickly got out of his car and he hustled over to the idling car to see what was happening. The patrolman came around to the open passenger door and shined a flashlight on the driver. And right away, he saw the driver was covered in blood and had been shot several times on the left side of their body. By the time the sun came out and people started gathering outside the courtroom for the inquest, the story had already hit the papers. Reginald Holmes had been murdered, only seven hours before he was scheduled to testify at the inquest. Without the police's star witness, the case against Patty Brady was bound to fail. For one thing, the police had no direct evidence tying Patty to Jim's murder, but as it would turn out, that wasn't even their biggest problem. At the inquest, which did end up happening, Patty's lawyer would argue that the court could not find Patty responsible for Jim's death since there was actually no hard evidence that Jim was even dead. All they knew was Jim was missing an arm and people can survive without an arm. And since this was technically true, the coroner was determined to have no authority to hold this inquest, which meant they had to shut it down. Patty would be acquitted of all charges. However, he would spend the rest of his life going in and out of jail for other offenses. Jim's body would never be found, and no one would ever be convicted for his murder. Nor would anyone ever be convicted for the murder of Reginald Holmes. Although some people believe Holmes's murder was orchestrated by his old friend and co-conspirator Albert Stannard, either to help his family collect on one of his many life insurance policies or to avoid him ruining both of their reputations by testifying at the inquest that would implicate both of them. Many people in Sydney considered these outcomes to be a huge miscarriage of justice and a total failure on the part of the police. But many other people in Sydney were quietly relieved that the people involved in this very bizarre shark arm case took their secrets of Sydney's underworld with them to the grave. By 1993, Ludmila Korovina, who was a 41-year-old Russian hiking instructor, came under fairly intense criticism from her colleagues for being too survivalist with her students. They thought she was a little bit too aggressive with how she pushed her students, putting them in unnecessarily risky situations out in the wild where they weren't really ready for it, and at any point, she might push them too far and wind up getting someone killed. Her students, however, absolutely adored her. They said on the mountains, she was fearless and in tune with nature, and they felt very safe around her. And then at camp, she was very motherly and tender and always took the time to make sure all of her students were taken care of well before she was. Former students have said the mentorship they received from Ludmila went well beyond just hiking instruction. They said she taught a mindset that they carried with them into adulthood and they pointed to as one of the main reasons they were successful later in life. In the summer of 1993, Ludmila was scheduled to lead an expedition up to the Hamar Daban Ridge, which is in eastern Siberia and it's one of the oldest mountains on the planet. 
With her on this expedition would be six fairly experienced hiking students that ranged in ages from 15 to 24 years old. One of those six students was a 23-year-old young man named Sasha, who, although he was not Ludmila's biological son, she called him her son because she had raised him ever since he was a young child, and he looked at Ludmila as his mother. Sasha also happened to be the most physically fit and competent of all six hiking students, and he would function more like an assistant to Ludmila on this particular hike rather than a pupil. The other five students were 24-year-old Tatiana, 19-year-old Dennis, 16-year-old Victoria, 15-year-old Timur, and 17-year-old Valentina, who she is the only reason we know anything about the horrible things that happened to this group up on Hamar Devon Ridge. On August 1st, 1993, Ludmila and her hiking group boarded a Trans-Siberian railway car in Kazakhstan, and later that day they arrived in a town called Marino, which is on the eastern side of Siberia on the southern end, and it butts up against the base of the Hamar Daban mountain range. The Hamar Daban mountain was not considered a very dangerous hike to make. It was relatively small, it was just under 2,400 meters in elevation, and in the summertime you'd have scores of recreational hikers all over this mountain range. Plus, the weather forecast for Ludmila and her group's multi-day hike in that mountain range was going to be incredibly favorable. It was going to be warm, clear, nice summer weather. Ludmila had charted a course that began just outside of the town of Marino, which is the town they were staying in that first night. They were going to start next to Lake Baikal, which is the deepest lake in Russia. From the lake, they were going to move north and inland over the stretch that was totally barren. There was no trees, it was just rocks and grass, before ultimately reaching the Hamar Daban Ridge, which was their destination. And at that point, there would be shelter and firewood, and they could take a break before ultimately descending. And so in total, from the lake all the way to Hamar Daban Ridge was approximately 50 miles. Ludmila's group would not be the only group making this particular movement towards Hamar Daban Ridge. They'd be taking their own path, but there'd be two other groups that were on similar courses, basically parallel to them, making their way up to the ridge. And one of those groups was actually led by Ludmila's 16-year-old biological daughter, and they had actually made plans to meet up on one of the last days of this multi-day hike. As they were making their descent, there was a forest they were going to meet up in. So Ludmila and her six students stayed the night in Marino, and the next morning they got up early and made their way over to Lake Baikal. The weather's beautiful, they're excited to start their journey, and they take off. And everything was going great until the late afternoon. It would turn out the weather forecasters were just completely wrong, and as soon as the group climbed above the tree line, the temperatures plummeted and it started raining and snowing on them. It was just absolutely miserable. This treacherous weather would persist over the next few days, and it really started to destroy the morale in the group. But Ludmila, she was a pro, and she had hiked in far worse conditions than this, and so she made a point of telling the group that this stuff happens. Bad weather happens. We are prepared. We are trained. We're going to be fine. You need to have a positive attitude about this. We need to just keep pushing forward and not play a victim here. And that was enough to inspire the group to just keep on going. You know, they believed in Ludmila, and she's telling them to keep going, so they kept going. By the evening of August 4th, so this is three full days of hiking later, they were only about 30 minutes away from the summit. They have now reached the point where they are in the open section of the mountain, where there is no reprieve from the wind or the rain or the snow. There's no trees to block anything. And so it's just an absolute abomination trying to climb this last stretch. Every step is like an eternity as the wind just cuts through their clothes and they're soaking wet and miserable. Ludmila's students were not about to ask for a break. They knew how she operated. She was someone that really believed in pushing through your own pain and fatigue and misery. And she always led by example. And they saw her, you know, right out in front leading the charge up towards the Hamar Daban Ridge. And so they were very surprised when she stopped. And she turned around and told them, we're taking a break. And in fact, we're actually going to camp out for the night right where we are right here. No one knows why Ludmila made this decision. You know, on the one hand, it does make sense to take a break and say, you know what, we'll reach the summit tomorrow. We've had a really hard couple of days here with the bad weather. We'll make camp and we'll get some rest and we'll, we'll hit the summit tomorrow. That makes sense. But where she elected to make camp does not make sense. She had them stop right smack dab in the middle of this totally open section of the mountain where there are no trees, there's no objects to protect them from the horrible wind and snow and ice and rain that's just going to be pelting them all night. 
And so some people have speculated that when she looked at her crew of hikers, they were so badly beaten down and tired and miserable that she knew she could not ask them to go any further. And so that was why she said, let's just make camp here, we'll make do. Others have said her map may not have been very accurate. And so she didn't know how close she was to the summit, where at the summit there was literally a shelter that had firewood and a place for you to rest. Maybe she didn't know she was so close. Perhaps she thought she was much farther away and this is the best we can do. But what the inaccurate map theory does not account for is Ludmila would have known there is a forest about two and a half miles down the mountain because the whole time they've been on this hike, they've tried to stay up above the tree line as they make this final approach up to the ridge. And so she would have known there's a forest right down there. And if I wanted to, I could go down there and seek shelter in the trees. And so for whatever reason, she decided that we can't go down to the forest, we gotta stay here. And so perhaps that lends more credibility to the idea that the group was far more beaten down than maybe we even realize. And she thought they can't make the two and a half mile journey. We're gonna have to just make camp here and make do. But regardless of her reasoning, they did make camp right in the middle of this open section. They set up two wet, crappy tents and they used their little kerosene stoves to make a tiny meal. And then they all crammed inside of these two tents and huddled as the wind howled outside. That night, the storm got much worse. The wind picked up, and again, they're totally exposed on this open section of the mountain, and so they're just getting destroyed by this wind. And at about 2 a.m., the wind actually broke the ropes that were holding the tents down, and they had to go outside and retie them, and they were able to do that. And then a couple hours later, at about 4 a.m., the wind actually lifted up the section of the tent that was facing where the wind was blowing, and it pulled the tent up in such a way that water rushed into the tent and soaked their sleeping bags. And they were able to go outside, and. They they put the stakes back down on the ground, but you know they were sleeping in wet sleeping bags in the middle of this mountain in the middle of a storm. So this is getting quite dangerous at this point. But they were able to eventually fall asleep. And at about 10 a.m. the next morning, Ludmila gets up and looks outside and she can see that everything's frozen, that it's snowed and the temperatures have dropped again and everything is just snow and ice. And she knows that, you know, we're actually reaching very dangerous hypothermia territory. And if we don't warm up soon, this could be life-threatening. And so she woke everybody up and she said, we need to go down into that forest and we need to start a fire as soon as possible. And so everybody said, all right, they got up, they started packing up their things, rolled up their tents, and they began walking down the mountain in a line. Although this was not intended, when Ludmila had said, we will reach the summit tomorrow, that had delayed their schedule. And it meant they were not gonna be able to meet up with her daughter the next day. But now in the morning, when they're deciding basically to abandon the summit and turn around and head down again, they were now back on schedule to meet up with her daughter down in the forest. However, her daughter said she was at the rendezvous point in the forest and Ludmila and the six other hikers never showed. Four days later on August 9th, a group of Ukrainian kayakers were making their way down this river in Southern Siberia and they were passing by the Hamar Devan mountain range. And so as they're kind of slowly moving their way down, it's this beautiful morning and they're looking up at the mountains all around them. The leader of this group happens to see something move on his left side. There's a forest right up against the left side of this river and he turns his head and he has to do a double take because there is this girl who's standing there at the edge of the forest looking out at them totally expressionless and she's covered in blood and she's not doing anything. She's just standing there. And at first he actually thought like, we need to leave. His first thought was we need to just get away from this person. There's something wrong with this person. But very quickly the group realized like we, we cannot abandon this girl. This is a young girl who should not be out here. I don't know what she's doing out here. And so they turned around and they went on shore and, and they yelled to her. They said, are, are you okay? And she just stood there not reacting. And they tried a couple more times to say, you know, hey, we're, we're not gonna hurt you. We just wanna know what's going on. And she didn't say a word. She just stood there in shock. She looked very scared. They finally got up right next to her and they, they asked her, you know, what are you, what are you so scared of? Where are you coming from? And they just could not get her to speak. But they're up close looking at her and you know she's got blood all over her she looks dirty she looks like she might be sick and so they decide that you know this girl needs help and they had blankets and so they threw blankets over her they put her in one of the kayaks and they brought her back to town once in town the ukrainian kayakers went and got authorities and said hey we found this girl you know she's covered in blood walking out of the forest we have no idea what's going on with her and so authorities came over to speak to her, and although she barely spoke, she would finally say that she was 17 years old, her name was Valentina Yudachenko, and that she had been a part of a seven-person hiking group up along the Hamar Deban Ridge. And then she paused, and they said, well, where's your hiking group? How did you get separated? This is what she told them. 
back on the morning of August 5th, so this would have been the morning after that terrible night's sleep on the mountain where the tent ropes are breaking and their sleeping bags are getting soaking wet. Well, Valentina wakes up and she looks outside of the tent and she sees Ludmila and she's standing there with her hands on her hips and she's looking around, she looks very concerned. Valentina goes out there and Ludmila turns to her and says, we need to leave, we need to go down to the forest and we need to make a fire. Can you help me wake everybody up and start having them pack up their stuff so we can get moving? And so Valentina goes in, she starts waking people up and everybody very quickly packs up the tent, packs up their things and they're in a line and they start walking down the mountain. They had only made it about 10 meters into their descent when Sasha, the 23-year-old young man that Ludmila considered her son, he just suddenly falls. And the other hikers, Valentina included, run over and they, they help get him up again and he looks kind of shaken. He takes a couple more steps and he falls again. And this time when Valentina goes over to try to help him up with the others, they see his eyes are wide and he looks like he's really terrified and then blood starts rushing out of his nose and his ears and his mouth and then he just suddenly dies. And Ludmila runs over and she grabs him and she's panicking and she's trying to feel for a pulse and she's checking for his heart. And then she screams out in pain and anguish and she yells, he's dead. The other hikers can't believe this is happening. They can't even process that someone, any of them had died, let alone it be Sasha, the most physically fit and healthy one of all of them, including up until a few minutes ago. He wasn't showing any signs or symptoms that something was wrong. He was perfectly fine. What's going on? Ludmila was in shock. She's on the ground and she's holding on to Sasha and she's telling the group that she's not going anywhere. She's staying with Sasha. And Valentina would say the group is just falling apart at this point. You have some of them that are crying, others who are just standing there looking around like what's happening to us right now. And at some point Ludmila collects herself and she says to the group, go down to the forest. Go down to the forest and start a fire. And Valentina said they didn't want to leave her and they were pleading with her to let them stay. And she said, no, go down to the forest and start a fire. And finally, Valentina said the group would. They'd get together and they'd turn around and not really knowing what was going to happen next, they just begin walking down this mountain and they'd only get a few steps before they hear Ludmila yell out to come back. She's saying, I can't move. And they turn around and Valentina was towards the front of the returning group as they're going back up the mountain back to Ludmila. And she's now bleeding out of her nose and her ears and her mouth. She's heaving like something's going on inside of her. And then all of a sudden she keels over on top of Sasha and she dies right in front of them. And now, now the group is in hysterics and Valentina's in the front and she can't see anybody else. And then she turns around and she can't believe what she's seeing to her side. Now everybody else is bleeding from their nose and their ears and their mouth and their, some of them are frothing from the mouth. Valentina reached for her mouth and her ears and her nose to look for blood and there wasn't any. And then she turned and she saw 16 year old Victoria and 24 year old Tatiana suddenly fall to the ground just like Sasha had, except they weren't just laying there. They began rolling around and ripping their clothes off and clutching at their throats and they're frothing at the mouth. And so Valentina reaches down to try to help Victoria, the 16 year old, and Victoria bites her on the hand and she pulls her hand back. And then Victoria curls into a ball and then goes still. And then Tatiana begins hitting her head on a rock over and over and over again until she goes still. At this point, Valentina is in pure survival mode. And so she looks at the other two, which was 15-year-old Timur and 19-year-old Dennis. Everybody else is, is down on the ground at this point. And she sees Dennis is moving behind a rock and he looks like he's not acting as erratic as everybody else. And so she starts making her way over to Dennis to see if he's gonna be okay. And on the way, she sees 15 year old Timur fall to the ground and he's suddenly lying there still. And so she believes he's dead too. She gets over to Dennis and he's bleeding profusely from all of his orifices in his head, but he's talking to her and he's saying, okay, you need to go back to your bag, get out whatever you can that is essential, ditch the rest and run down to the forest and I'll meet you down there. And so Valentina says, okay, she makes her way up to her bag. She gets her sleeping bag and a couple other small items. And when she turns around to go back to Dennis, she sees that he's now slouched over his backpack and now the blood is just pouring out of his head. And she can tell that almost certainly he's dead as well. And so not only is she all alone, she's now totally traumatized and believes whatever has happened to them is gonna happen to her. And so she runs down the mountain and she goes into the forest and she gets underneath this rock overhang. She puts her sleeping bag down, she crawls inside and she drifts in and out of consciousness for the rest of the day. And then that night, she's still laying there and the storm picked up dramatically and she could hear all night these huge trees all over the mountain falling and slamming all around her. And so she's thinking, if I don't die from whatever killed my friends, I'm gonna get hit by one of these trees. 
but she manages to get through the night. The next morning, the storm had cleared, and so Valentina gets up, and she's thinking to herself, maybe by some miracle, one of them is still alive. And so she climbs back up the mountain to where they were, and she finds all of them still laying exactly where they were when she left them, all motionless, all deceased. And so she decides to go one by one and close each of their eyelids, and then she says her goodbye, and then she turns and kind of wanders back into the forest, where she would stay for the next four days, desperately walking around, hoping to be rescued at some point the whole time, just expecting to die either from exposure, from an animal attack, from whatever killed my friends. Eventually she does hear voices and she starts making her way towards where they're coming from. And that's when she gets to the river and she sees the Ukrainian kayakers who ultimately pick her up and bring her back to town. After authorities heard Valentina's story and realized there were other hikers out there, they launched a search party and it would take them a month to locate them. Their bodies were contorted and their faces were locked in these, these grimaces that looked like they were in absolute terror and agony right as they died. In addition to missing most of their clothing and their shoes, they were also all missing their eyeballs. The autopsies were only able to conclude that hypothermia contributed to their death, although it wasn't the only factor, as well as a protein deficiency, despite the fact that they had all eaten well over the course of their trip, and that all of their lungs were very bruised, but they didn't know what that was from. But nothing the autopsy concluded could reconcile what Valentina said she saw happen, which was a sudden, violent death of six healthy people with no signs and symptoms leading up, suddenly they are bleeding out of every orifice and they're falling to the ground, tearing their clothes off, grabbing at their throats, frothing at the mouth, and then dying. And whatever happened to them, why didn't it happen to Valentina? To this day, we don't really have a good answer why that happened, and the case is closed. It was ruled they mostly died of hypothermia and it was an accident, and that's that. But this isn't the first time something like this has happened in Russia. In 1959, nine very experienced Russian hikers set off on a 16-day expedition into the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union, and about 10 days into their hike, they reached a part where they needed to crest over this mountain before some bad weather rolled in, and they started moving up this mountain, which would be renamed the Dyatlov Pass after the leader of this group, his name is Dyatlov. They started making their way up the Dyatlov Pass, and they were going too slowly, and the weather was coming in too quickly. And so they had to make a critical decision. Stay put, but be in this totally exposed open mountain face, much like the Hamar Daban situation where they were up on that open mountain face, either hunker down there and get ruined by weather. And the weather was a lot worse for the Dyatlov Pass group. It was, you know, sub-zero temperatures and just snowing ruthlessly. Or they could go down and give up ground and go down to the forest at the base of this mountain where you'd be sheltered from the storm with some trees. And so these hikers, who might be a little bit overconfident in their ability, decide to stick it out right on this mountain face. And over the course of that night, at some point, they cut open their tent with a knife from the inside and ran out into sub-zero temperatures, most of them not wearing shoes, not wearing jackets, not wearing pants. They're basically in underwear. And they calmly walked down the mountain all the way down to the forest. And once they got down there, two of them tried to desperately climb this big tree where there wasn't any low hanging branches. And so they couldn't climb up it. We don't know what they were trying to climb up it for, but they ended up building this little tiny fire that could not have provided very much warmth at all. And they were found deceased lying around this fire. The seven other hikers were found in two different areas. One that appeared to go down to that tree where those two were, but then doubled back and tried to get up to the campsite, but didn't make it and fell to the ground and died there. The other group was not found for a couple of weeks later. They were found at the mouth of this river. They were inside of this, this den, and they were wearing the clothes of the other hikers that were deceased and the clothes they had on had traces of radiation on them, and the ones that were in the den had these devastating chest and skull injuries, and one of them was missing their eyeballs. And the official statement by the Soviet Union was they died from an unknown compelling force, which is a really mysterious way to describe how someone might die. This case was actually reinvestigated in 2020, and the new cause of death is death by avalanche, except loads of people disagree with that. In fact, experts have gone out to where this happened, and they say not only was there no avalanche, there's never been an avalanche in this area. There's literally never been one. So what do you think? Is there a connection between Hamar Daban and the Dyatlov Pass incident? Is there a cover-up in both cases where something far more sinister has happened to both groups that we don't know about? 
or are they unrelated and these are just both examples of mother nature being far more powerful than we even realize the next and final story of today's episode is a mr ballin fan favorite it's called bell's canyon In 2016, a 25-year-old Wall Street banker named Matt was camping near Mount Rainier in Washington State. His job was so hectic that in the rare times he got a chance to, he would disappear into the wilderness for a few days to clear his head. Despite living in one of the biggest cities in the world, Matt was actually a very competent outdoorsman, and so for this trip, he decided he would stay way off any trail deep in the backcountry in random locations. On the first night, he found a nice clearing in the trees, and so he set up his campsite there. He ate some food over his fire, he pitched his tent, climbed inside, and within a few minutes he was fast asleep. Several hours later, Matt woke up to some strange sounds coming from outside of his tent. It sounded like a couple of animals or maybe one animal moving around right outside. And so after a while of just hearing this constant sound, he rolled over and he barely unzipped his tent flap just to look out and see if he could see whatever animal it was. And what he saw shocked him. There was a man sitting in front of his fire pit. There was no fire in his fire pit. And the guy was just sitting there with his hands on his knees, looking straight down. And periodically, he would just kick his feet in the ashes of the fire pit. And Matt didn't even know what to do. So he's just looking at him through this little tiny gap in his tent. And this man all of a sudden looks up directly at Matt and makes eye contact with him. And the guy's eyes go wide and he stands up, turns around and runs away from Matt's campsite. Matt has no idea how to react to this, and so he just quickly unzips his tent, jumps outside, and shines his light into the forest looking for this guy. He's thinking to himself, who is this guy? I am in the middle of nowhere in the backcountry of Washington State. How long was he sitting outside there for? What does he want? And so as Matt is trying to make sense of this totally weird thing, he's thinking, okay, I'm going to look out and I'm going to see his flashlight somewhere, or I'm going to see his campsite. You know, maybe he's set up nearby and he's looking around into the total darkness. He's looking through all the trees, any light source, anywhere out there he would see. And there's not one. There's no fire. There's no flashlight. There is nothing. And so eventually Matt goes back inside of his tent. He zips it up and he's just left kind of dumbfounded. He can't understand how some person was just sitting outside of his tent for no apparent reason and then vanished into the forest without even turning on a flashlight. And so after a very restless night, finally the sun came up again and Matt was very relieved. He stepped outside and after a little bit of time now from this strange incident, Matt started to tell himself that all that was is some guy happened to set up his campsite nearby. It is possible, albeit rare because we're in the backcountry and maybe he was just intoxicated and he wandered over here and you know, stranger things have happened. So that's probably all it was. And so Matt felt like there was nothing to worry about. He packed up his campsite and he began hiking into the forest. Matt didn't have a planned route. Instead, he had a map and a compass and he began just kind of wandering in the forest, kind of exploring wherever he wanted to go. And over the next two days, he covered at least 10, maybe 15 miles in kind of random zigzag directions. He found a nice clearing and he set up another campsite. That night, he set up a fire and he was eating some food near his fire. And then as he's sitting there, he hears rustling coming from behind him. And he's pretty sure it's an animal, so he turns around and he doesn't see anything. And he goes back to eating his food. And then a little while later, he hears some more rustling behind him. And this time, he can't really just write it off. Clearly, there is something behind him that's moving around. And so he stood up, turned around, and remained motionless and just listened, expecting to see maybe a deer come out of the woods. But instead, he hears a man's voice come out of the darkness that says, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? And Matt's heart starts racing. He knows that even though he can't see him, it has to be the same guy he saw two days ago. Because they are in the middle of nowhere. He hasn't seen any other hikers or campers or anyone. And clearly this guy has the ability to sneak up on him. And so he's thinking, what does this guy want? I just spent the past two days hiking in random directions for 15 miles and he must have followed me. And so Matt, not knowing what else to do, just says, I don't know where Bell's Canyon is. And then there's silence. And Matt, one part of him is thinking, I hope this guy does not come into the light. I hope he just goes away. 
The other part of him is thinking, well, you know, maybe this is a different person that is lost and they're looking for this place called Bell's Canyon and they'll come into the light. It'll be a big relief. I'll send them on their merry way and everything will be fine. But as Matt is having this wishful thinking, the voice from the shadows does not come any closer, but instead asks the same question a bit more forcefully this time. Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? This time, Matt did not respond. Now he was scared. This is not some friendly hiker looking for directions. There's something wrong. And so Matt, knowing he's all alone out here, he knew he had to do something to try to take control of this situation. And so he took a deep breath, he reached down and grabbed his flashlight, and in one swift motion, he lifted his light up and shined it in the direction of this guy's voice. And what he saw was this guy from two days ago looking out from behind a tree right in Matt's direction. He was hiding from him. And when the light hit him, the man barked at Matt to aim it away. And Matt kind of instinctively lowered his light, but now he was too scared to raise it again, and now he knows it's the same guy. This guy has been following me for two days. And so for several minutes, Matt just stood there absolutely terrified, and this guy, he just stayed out there. Matt didn't hear him move. It was just a complete standstill. And then the silence was broken yet again by this voice, except somehow he had moved even closer to Matt. And when he came through asking the same question, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? His voice was so close to Matt that Matt got scared and raised his light up, and the man was standing just a few feet away from him. And this time, the man's eyes got wide like they did the first time they saw Matt, and he turned around and he ran into the forest again. Matt, not knowing any better, just began running after him, but he only ran for about 30 seconds before he realized the terrain out here is so rough. He's gonna fall, get hurt, he's gonna get lost, and this guy's already long gone. He somehow managed to run immediately so far away, and so Matt just goes back to his campsite, and he's thinking to himself, what do I do? I have no cell phone service, I'm at least three days away from my car, and I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one even knows where I am because I didn't chart a course. I didn't tell anyone where I was going to be. And so Matt just grabbed his knife and stood in the middle of the campsite, and for hours and hours he just kept looking around, expecting this guy to just show up again or start speaking to him from somewhere out in the darkness. It was absolutely horrifying. Finally, by about three in the morning, Matt was so tired that he had to go to sleep. He hadn't heard this guy again, he didn't see him again, and he figured, I need a little bit of sleep because tomorrow he's going to pack up his campsite and begin this epic journey back to his car. And so he climbed in his tent and he had a very restless next couple of hours. Then the sun came up, Matt jumped out of his tent, packed up his stuff, and began practically running in the direction of his car. All day, as he was hiking, Matt kept looking over his shoulder, expecting to see this guy, because clearly he had followed him for multiple days, over 15 miles, and so the likelihood that he's still following him was really high. And so all day, Matt just felt like he was being watched, he was totally terrified, and then the sun started to go down, and Matt knew he would have to camp out again. And so he found a clearing in the trees, he set up his campsite, and he was so tired from running basically all day and being so mentally exhausted from this experience that he just got in his tent and fell asleep very quickly. But several hours later, he woke up to the sound of somebody walking around his tent. And he knew it had to be this guy. He's still in the middle of nowhere. He's not even close to the parking lot yet. And so this guy is still following him. And so Matt sat up in his tent, he clutched his knife, and for hours and hours and hours, all night, this guy just walked around his campsite. And then around four or five in the morning, he scampered off. When the sun finally came up, Matt leapt out of his tent, packed up his stuff, and literally just began running in the direction of his car, hoping that maybe he could get there before needing to camp out one more night. And so all day as he moved, he's looking over his shoulder, knowing this guy is following him. At this point, it's not even a question. He's somewhere in the forest, but he could never see him. And unfortunately, as the sun was setting, he knew he was not going to be able to make it to his car. He was just too far away. And so at some point, when it got too dark to keep moving, he had to find a clearing and set up his tent again. And so once his tent was set up, he just climbed inside, grabbed his knife, and sat there, knowing this guy was somewhere out there. And so Matt climbed inside of his tent, he zipped it up behind him, he grabbed his knife, and he sat there expecting to hear this guy come walking around. But after several hours, he didn't hear him. And Matt started to wonder, maybe this guy has left me alone, finally. Maybe he's not following me anymore. And so Matt, who was totally exhausted, laid down to go to sleep. And then as he's laying there from somewhere out in the woods, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? Matt immediately sat up, his heart began racing so fast that he actually was concerned he might have a heart attack. 
and he didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say, so he just sat there holding his knife. And then this guy began running past his campsite making animal sounds, and he would stop periodically and moan and grunt, and he'd kick up leaves, and then he'd run past his campsite again, over and over and over again, until the sun finally came up and this guy scampered off back into the woods. Matt didn't waste any time. He leapt out of his tent, packed his stuff up, and ran all the way back to his car. When he finally got inside of his car, shut the door and locked it, he cried tears of joy. He was so unbelievably relieved. And he peeled out of the parking lot, he got to a nearby hotel, he finally got cell phone reception, and he considered calling the police about this guy, but he thought, you know, what am I gonna tell them? He didn't commit a crime, he was just terrifying. And so he decided not to call the police. He finally flew back to New York and he just had to accept that there was some strange guy out in the wilderness of Washington state who was able to hunt him over three days and 30 miles in rugged terrain without the use of a flashlight, without any gear. And all he ever said to Matt was, do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please kidnap the five-star review button and then force them to brush their teeth with a very minty toothpaste. When they're done, make them drink a huge glass of orange juice. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and everywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username on all platforms is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.